uh, all the relativistic astrophysics community uh, knows the heroic uh, uh, aspect of the life, scientific life of uh, Sachiko, which we have recalled in uh, her presentation. And it's a fantastic example of uh, a professor who travels every year on the northern hemisphere of the Earth, starting from Montana and then going to Japan and then coming to Europe and then going back yearly to Montana. And uh, initially I was thinking to, to have uh, a, a starting from Montana in the old days, every year the bisons were going to Florida and coming back then uh, 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 after six months up in the, in, the, in the Montana region. And I think the case of uh, Sachiko is uh, a, still a yearly activity starting in Montana, but uh, instead of uh, going like the bisons in, uh, uh, in Florida, from the beautiful uh, landscape of the mountains, uh, Sachiko goes around a beautiful place on the earth, Kyoto, uh, starting from Montana, coming to Europe and going back yearly in, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, the university, teaching still young and, and, uh, 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 and still students and postdoc and having an um, activity really as a unique example. Thank you very much for your <laughs> kind introduction. But uh, since it's getting late, I think I would rather give a more popular talk than a detailed uh, uh, physics. So since I started uh, the neutron star physics, uh, when not many people are interested, uh, I will give a brief, brief summary of uh, the historical background. And many people now work on neutron stars, but uh, uh, maybe you do not, do not know how it uh, started. So brief summary of the history. So the early to mid-1930s, Oppenheimer and the work of the theory predicted the existence of, uh, of neutron stars. Then Zwicky and Bade predicted that uh, supernova explosion will produce uh, neutron stars. And then the war started, so nobody was interested. And then in the late 1950s, uh, John A. Wheeler's group in Princeton calculated the structure of white dwarfs and neutron stars for ideal Fermi gas, meaning no nuclear interactions. And then uh, A.G.W. Cameron in, and some others included the nuclear uh, force in the late 1950s. Then uh, what happened is in the early 1960s, the Japanese group uh, found uh, ex strong X-ray source, X-ray emission from SCOE-X1, Scopius, and this is the uh, first X-ray source in Scopius, and uh, then uh, several theorists thought that uh, Hayakawa and uh, Sarupita so forth, uh, it must be a neutron star. And since uh, I have only half an hour, I want no time to tell why, but then uh, if it's a neutron star, uh, since the radius is so small uh, to be observable, like uh, the solar luminosity, uh, temperature has to be million degrees, then immediately that's X-rays. So it's a strong X-ray source, so they thought it might be a neutron star. On the other hand, however, uh, the spectrum was ro uh, wrong, it was uh, the black body. And then the Friedman's group uh, uh, did a lunar occultation of the club, and uh, uh, X-ray source has extended. But now uh, we know that the uh, score X1 is in a binary, but the emission that time, because of the crude instrument, uh, came from the disk, not from the star. And now, at that time, 
what they observed was from the nebula, not from the neutron stars. So they thought uh, it's not the neutron stars. And uh, so just to give us uh, entertainment, I give the picture of uh, uh, AGW Cameron, my supervisor at Columbia, and Hayakawa, uh, he's one of the founding father of Japanese extra astronomy. They were directly involved in this early part of neutron star history. And so uh, about that time, I was in Colombia and uh, working on PhD thesis. So Cameron and I were interested in if neutron star is hot enough to be observable. So we did detailed calculations of thermal cooling of neutron stars, really. And uh, the result was this. This uh, took from my PhD thesis. So uh, for temperature to be like uh, six to 10 to 6 to 7, that X-rays, uh, it's observable and uh, for about a million years. So in principle, uh, neutron stars can be uh, surface radiation from neutron stars can be observable. However, my calculations showed that the score X1 luminosity was far too strong. And as I said, in the end, it happened that the, the, what they observed was from the disk, not from the star. Here again, the club, uh, it was a club nebula, and not from the neutron star. So people started saying, well, it's not, there are no neutron stars. And uh, in 1966, Bakola and Wolf suggested that if a neutron star has pions, it will cool too fast, so we will never observe them, even if they existed. And at that time, Bakola suggested that I should bet that a neutron star will be observable, and he will bet that it will never be observable. And at that time, I was still young, so I said, a nice Japanese girl should not bet. Then, next year, Pulsar was discovered. And so in 1967, uh, <coughs> Pulsar was discovered in the club. So I decided it doesn't pay to be a nice Japanese girl. <laughs> and uh, maybe that's why I survived until today. Anyway, so after that, the uh, launch of Yufuru, the first X ray satellite, and then uh, we had more extra galactic X-ray sources. And then Rosat finally, uh, and uh, actually Einstein uh, <coughs> satellite uh, found uh, upper limit to a neutron star's temperature, but Rosat really detected. So I will show that, uh, it later uh, how it happened, but uh, uh, then the launch of Chandra and X-ray Newton, and there are many, many more X-ray sources were uh, discovered, and many of them were neutron stars. So people now think neutron stars are something very uh, well, common and nothing exotic. But uh, when I started, they thought it was something uh, uh, crazy. Anyway, so. Uh, many, many X-ray sources were discovered, and uh, about neutron stars, there were uh, binaries and X-ray pulsars and all of this stuff. So I just summarized the uh, early part of neutron star history in this uh, book of proceedings of neutron star conference uh, in Kyoto in 1990. And I organized with uh, Dr. Tamagaki and Pines. And uh, this is a cartoon uh, Dr. Oda uh, put in the uh, evening banquet uh, uh, talk. And uh, so this one sort of summarizes the hist early history of neutron stars. And I just decided to show this picture because the neutron star people who were active in those days, this is Gordon Bain and Hayakawa and uh, David Pines, and Tamagaki, and so forth. So I thought uh, uh, this is more like a historical uh, picture, so I decided to show this. Now, I will skip all this uh, structure thing, because I have no time. But uh, now I'm going to show 
first is the status of this neutron star cooling uh, in, the, in the early days, in, before 1990. And uh, because the neutron star surface temperature was measured, there are f these, those two, four pulsars, the, these are the me measurements. The upper limit is just uh, it's, uh, less than this, but those are the detections. So we compared, and this was consistent with my early calculations of uh, at my PhD thesis, but because a neutron star temperature was measured, no matter and I started uh, calculating more accurately, including uh, general relativity, not only in mechanical equations, but the thermal equations. And I just summarized two important uh, uh, neutrino process. The first, this standard cooling, the ordinary uh, beta process, and there are other process, but this is a re leading one. It, we call it standard. It, it has to be modified because it uh, degenerates uh, particles. Uh, so this, this shows the uh, uh, standard cooling. So at least those, at least those two sources, uh, you can uh, standard cooling is okay, and that's what I did for my uh, thesis. Also, it goes like this. However, there are sources like this one. It's a Vera pulsar, and this is too low. And then we, uh, where people suggested there are fast cooling. These are the fast cooling we call direct uh, fast cooling, and we call it non-standard. And uh, the, there are exotic particles like uh, uh, pyparons and uh, pions, kaons, so forth, or even quarks. Then the direct cooling is possible. Now this is the modified standard cooling is modified because of the degeneracy of particles. Uh, a lot of space uh, phase space was forbidden by the uh, this uh, uh, Pauli's exclusion principle, but. Uh, in some cases, we, here, we, that we can have a direct uh, beta process. Then it cools very fast. However, the pro problem is that uh, it's too fast, as we will show soon. But uh, those particles, if they are in superfluid state, uh, fast cooling is suppressed. And then it will be like this. So in this, in the 19... 80s, uh, note and I showed that uh, all the detected sources are consistent with uh, cooling theories, and uh, hot ones are standard, and, but the non-standard one uh, is too fast, so we need the suppression by superfluid uh, uh, properties. So that's what happened. Now, so I will just uh, briefly uh, summarize the ingredients uh, input to the calculations. So the in most important is this neutrino process. So the standard cooling uh, is modified, uh, Ulka and others. And then standard cooling is fast cooling. When you have exotic particles and the nucleons, neutrons and protons also become uh, fast cooling uh, when uh, there are sufficient composition of uh, protons. A proton fraction increases, this uh, is also, also opens, and they are very, all very fast. And uh, then, oh, oh yes, okay. So this is how it's calculated by Nomoto and Umeda and so forth. So this is a standard cooling. All the non-standard possible cooling is very fast. Certainly, for the, uh, the important source is the Vera. So Vera is here. It's too cool for standard cooling, but it's uh, hot for non-standard cooling. These are all possible candidates for non-standard fast cooling. So here comes the effect of superfluidity, that if the particles in question is in superfluid state, the fast cooling is suppressed. And when the temperature gets below the critical temperature, and this critical temperature uh, depends on the gap of the superfluid pairs. And here the temperature as a function of density. And if the, the first for the low densities, 
プロトン、ニュートロン、インスーパーバッテリー、it's rather small, so effect is not too big. But now, this, uh, this, in this case, is the high parons. So the energy gap and the critical temperature is large. So as you increase the mass from the low mass to high mass, density increases from low to high, then the, so the like 1.4 solar mass star uh, is a neutron star here. But when the mass gets to like 10 to 7, 1.7 solar mass, then uh, density gets higher than the critical density here. So here is a, the big uh, suppression happens. That means this uh, below this, uh, the temperature depends on the gap. And that's uh, this, suppress, this the amount of suppression. So as you go from low mass to high mass, low mass is a neutron star. Then here is a fast cooling with suppression. But if the mass is high enough, suppression disappears. So it's a, it's a fast cooling. So that's the essence of uh, the input physics. And there is another uh, heating. Uh, and I have no time to explain, so you can just read this. Another important thing is the composition of the uh, envelope. And if the envelope is made of heavy elements, that's what we used to, I used for my thesis and others. However, uh, it was suggested that if light elements uh, sort of fall, falling, from, uh, falling back from the supernova, and uh, accumulate in the envelope, then the light elements have a uh, higher conductivity. That means during the star is cooling with a uh, neutrino uh, process in the neutrino is the center and outside uh, from the radiation, but by photons. And uh, so uh, what happens is uh, because of, even though cooling is uh, controlled by neutrino uh, escape from the um, core, uh, the surface temperature is higher if the uh, element is light, like hydrogen. Then the conductivity increases, so the surface temperature increases. So those are the major uh, ingredients. So here I show the uh, latest uh, cooling curve. And it went a long way in 50 years. But anyway, so this is a 1.4 solar mass star cooling as a neutron star. And then effect of heating pushes this up to here. And now the effect of this light element uh, envelope uh, pushes so to, to, to this one, the, the dotted one. So they are only 1.4 solar mass neutron stars. But as a, uh, Mass increases from one point point to about two solar masses uh, because of the superfluid suppression is large at this time. So this curve pushes up to here uh, for this uh, mass. And then uh, when the uh, start mass is enough like two solar masses, then suppression disappears. So this the latest, coolest one. This is a direct uh, ulka and the direct fast cooling Oh, and uh, with no suppression. But because depending on the superfluid gap, uh, we can have all the intermediate ones. Uh, these are the data points from uh, latest uh, satellites like Chandra and XM. So we have many, many uh, data now. So the, this one shows that uh, this source A, we need hydrogen uh, envelope. To, for this curve, and now uh, for the Vera supernova, is C is the detection, C is a Vera parser. So C is, a, to explain C, you need uh, suppression of the so fast cooling suppress all the way to here. Uh, they, that explains uh, Vera, finally. And now for sources like this, you need heating. So that sort of explains all the data points. And they, they are uh, sort of uh, upper limits. So there can be, so, but if these, uh, these are detections, then there are, we, may need, we may need massive star with fast cooling. So this 
This one summarizes the current status. And as far as the cooling of and heating of uh, ordinary pulsars and neutron stars is concerned, this is more like the final uh, saying at the moment. But there are a few, uh, <coughs> well, later on I will explain some uh, still unsolved problems. But uh, now, to, so the conclusion is for some of the stars like Vera, we need fast cooling suppressed by superfluid. Now, so, however, uh, suppression depends on the particles. For instance, if there are k-ones or uh, nu neutron, nucleon uh, uh, composition, uh, and uh, it, there are no suppressions. However, uh, if um, our uh, Kyoto, Kyoto nuclear group uh, shows that if there are pions, the suppression is all right. And the hyperon uh, could be okay, but uh, there were some uh, uh, laboratory experiments which said that uh, the gap may not be so large as uh, uh, what I showed earlier. However, those experiments were done for heavy elements. And these are the light elements, so hyperon case is still possible, or we, we need future development on nuclear and the particle physics to settle that point. But uh, since my time is running out, another important way to find the temperature uh, is uh, X-ray binaries. So uh, it's called uh, soft X-ray transients, low mass X-ray binaries. And uh, I gave all the references, but just briefly, the neutron star mini nova and accretion until critical density and energy is produced by nuclear reactions beneath the surface in the crust. And uh, so deep crust fitting, heating. So this, these two simple equations summarize what's happening. That means so this uh, energy is released in the deep uh, beneath the, in the crust. And that will escape from this neutrino from interior and uh, photons from the surface. And now this uh, heating uh, released, uh, heating is related directly to the accretion rate. And uh, so in this way, the accretion rate uh, is directly related to the photon luminosity, which depends on the uh, surface temperature, because we assume black body, and internal temperature uh, and uh, effective temperature can be, uh, the difference can be calculated by using the models. So in this way, you can plot the uh, photon luminosity versus uh, uh, accretion rate. And this one was calculated by my students uh, recently. So the, it's sort of a goes parallel to the cooling curve. That means for the low mass star, the, these are the points. That means the luminosity, photon luminosity plotted against the mass accretion rate. And the low mass stars, uh, these sources agree with the neutron, uh, neutron star cooling. And this one is a, a fast cooling with no suppression. But what we need is there are two uh, detections data point to explain this, uh, we need the suppression of uh, fast cooling. And uh, so the that cannot exp explain by the uh, standard cooling, cannot explain by fast cooling, but we need suppression here. So these are the uh, points we have at the moment. So here I give the tentative uh, conclusion. I say tentative because like a hyperon case, we need more experiments to see if the gap of hyperon is big enough so that the suppression is enough. And the pion case, the Kyoto group calculated suppression is enough. So the pion case is okay. So the non-standard cooling, uh, so, the, so pr probably we need to uh, explain cooler stars, we need non-standard fast cooling. And now we need heating 
for some of those sources I showed, hot, hotter ones. And also the light element uh, is needed for some of the data. And now the stars with the pion case uh, is consistent uh, so far. So uh, recently, my student calculated uh, the pion uh, cooling. And the figure I showed earlier was for hyperons, but we got a similar result. So now, the, so the hyperon case and the quark case, at the moment, the gap is too large for uh, quarks, but there are some theories, theories uh, that uh, you can get away with them, but we need more work needed. And uh, so, but already the Tamagaki group showed that this nucleon and kion, uh, uh, kion uh, fast cooling uh, are unlikely. So there are, we are not, uh, well, we don't know everything, but we are getting uh, more understandings. So I think I will give the brief uh, summary of what's, uh, what's happening now. So as far as this uh, neutron star temperature of ordinary pulsars and neutron stars, uh, the last curve I showed is more like uh, the uh, current uh, understanding. And uh, as I said, uh, we calculated a pion case because the hyperon case may be in trouble, but uh, qualitatively the conclusion is the same, very similar. Now, uh, I just uh, point out two uh, things happening lately. And one is that uh, so one is that uh, uh, Raffini, Lofton Raffinian group lately uh, started some calculations of neutron star structure. And since I don't have time, I just give a reference. So this is a paper published. That means instead of Oppenheimer Volkov standard equation for the, uh, uh, they, start, they started using some more uh, generalized. Uh, uh, equations. And uh, I have no time, uh, you can ask Dr. Raffini uh, what it is, but uh, I just confine, well, here I ju just summarized what's happening. And here I just uh, uh, confine myself to uh, effect on cooling. The, the, the briefly, it, what it means is uh, the neutron star is uh, electrically neutral all over, so, so locally too. But uh, this, uh, this theory says that uh, global, uh, globally neutron star is electrically neutral, but not necessarily locally. And in fact, in the boundary between the crust and uh, core, there are some electric charge. And uh, so I have no time to explain the details. But uh, I just tell the effect on cooling. The effect on cooling is that uh, here, uh, this gives the effect on something called uh, relaxation time. What it means is the following. Uh, when a neutron star was uh, made, uh, neutrino cooling is very fast in the core. And it takes some time for the uh, very fast cooling in the core to be the information reaches the surface. And that time scale is called the relaxation time. So naturally, if the uh, crust is thick, it takes longer time. So the relaxation time is large. On the other hand, uh, if it's s s small, uh, it's, uh, well, the relaxation will be short. So, and all, but it's more complicated. Uh, the crust, have, we have inner crust and outer crust. And the inner crust, some neutron process is going. So while uh, center is cooling very fast, and uh, it take, it, that information doesn't reach the surface, the crust, in the crust there are neutron cooling, not as much as so core. And that also uh, determines the uh, uh, relaxation time. So the relaxation time is uh, short, then uh, it gives a big change on the uh, cooling properties. 
So this is effect is important uh, while a neutron star set before settle down to the isothermal state. So while this is uh, going on, so before the relaxation time is reached, this effect will be uh, important. And uh, so uh, and relaxation time is about 10 to 1,000 years, depending on the equation of state. And the stiff equation, there are fat uh, crust is thick, so uh, it, relaxation time is long. So those things affect young neutron stars' uh, evolution very seriously. And another is the effect of strong uh, magnetic field. And uh, I just started, but there are some other people doing this. And uh, lately, the Space Science Review asked me to review a paper by this uh, Potekin, pot this paper. And I accepted it a few weeks ago, so this will be published soon. And this paper sort of summarizes the effect of strong magnetic field. So if there are magnetars, uh, it will give important effect. And uh, I'll just uh, tell you about uh, what we call Cassé controversy. And you know that there are neutron stars in Cassé. And however, uh, one group, Heinke, Hon, so forth, they said that the Cassé uh, cools very fast. However, Powell says uh, it's not. So it's controversial. And they both are. Uh, uh, observers, and uh, they were analyzing the same data. But uh, so uh, sort of, uh, it's, the problem is not settled, so we don't know. However, if this problem is settled and the neutral star is cooling fast, then like the, uh, what I mentioned in this new uh, effect of global neutrality, th this can be tested. So unfortunately, uh, young stars, so far it's Cassé only, but if the equation of state is uh, very stiff, uh, relaxation time lasts about 1,000 years, so that might uh, affect the other stars which are younger than 1,000 years. So there are still many things to do, but uh, uh, this is a summary of how we are here. Okay. <coughs> There are questions. <clears throat> well, uh, if not, I would like to uh, thank very much uh, Sachiko for this uh, very nice presentation. But uh, I would like still to let you know why we came back with so great interest to your uh, cooling curves. And uh, usually, the neutron star you have been uh, presenting, they are uh, quite old uh, systems. Uh, yeah. But uh, I think there is a chance, but uh, uh, we will discuss, now that it's more relaxed, we will discuss maybe tomorrow, okay. that, the, uh, for example, in uh, GRB 98 or 425, where there was a supernova, which clearly must generate a neutron star. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it was a binary system, it must have been also an outer neutron star, that you catch uh, uh, this neutron star just at the moment of the birth, That's where right. the maximum temperature should be. Yeah, and yeah. it's uh, very interesting that some of them, like 98 to 425, after 20 years, they still emit X-ray, and it will be very, very interesting to see if you can explain with your curve of the cooling yeah. some of this effect. Yeah, yeah. But I think the, the possibility to uh, use gamma ray burst to locate just born uh, neutron star is very, very important yeah. to check uh, yeah. still today yeah. your uh, fundamental theory. Yeah, okay.